Hey, good morning and welcome to Abundant Life. Uh, we're a church located in upstate New York in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains and just want to tell you, uh, number one, how glad we are that you've joined us for today's worship service. And secondly, just to kind of tell you about um, what we're going to be doing this morning or this evening, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, we've got a couple of worship songs that we're going to do together. Uh, that's going to be followed by a few announcements, and then we'll get into today's word uh, from the book of Exodus, uh, which is a series that we've been doing. One thing that we really want to lay before you is that we feel that is an essential part of the journey of a follower of Jesus to be connected with a local church. And so no matter where you are located uh, today, um, whether you're in New York State or someplace else, I uh, really want to encourage you to seek and to find uh, a Bible-based uh, local church where you can receive from you know, other people as well as uh, the leadership of that church. If you need any help finding a local church in your area, feel free to reach out to us uh, by sending us a message. But uh, let's just kind of begin to prepare our hearts for uh, the Lord to do something new in us today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness today, your goodness that sees us through every season of life, Father. I thank you that uh, you've got a, a plan and a purpose for our future, God, and it's, a, it's one that you have declared is good. And so, Father, this morning we want to remove all distraction um, from our from our eyes, move, remove all distraction from our minds and our hearts, Father. We want to see you, we want to worship you, and we want to know you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness like a mighty mountain, yeah, and your justice flows like the ocean tide, and I will lift my voice to worship you, my I will find the strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens in your faithfulness. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain, yeah, and your justice flows like the ocean tide, and I will I will live my voice. 
your faithfulness stretches to the sky. You give life our love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord.
Hey, what a great time we had together in worship. Uh, that, those videos that you saw were shot uh, right around here in the Adirondacks. Um, can't really do that for too much longer because I'm sure that we will be receiving feet of snow here in the near future, but uh, we need to enjoy our, the creation around us while we can, I guess. But we want to tell you just a few announcements here at Abundant Life, uh, some things to let you know about. Um, at our in-person service next week, it's the fifth Sunday of the month, and at Abundant Life, every time that we have a fifth Sunday, uh, what we like to do is to keep our children in the sanctuary for the whole service, and we usually teach around a topic um, that is relevant to the whole family, uh, or we'll do children's activities. Uh, for this time, we're going to be actually in that, the, the way that this worked out. This week that we have uh, the fifth Sunday, we have the, the 12th chapter of Exodus, and it's the Passover story. And so um, next week, the fifth Sunday of November, uh, we're going to be taking communion together and really teaching on communion from a family perspective. And so that's going to be the fifth Sunday here at Abundant Life. You'll see the date and things on the screen. If you're in our area, we'd love to have you uh, join with us. Also, just want to tell you about our men's and our women's groups for the month of December. Uh, we have been meeting the past couple of months on Wednesday evenings. Uh, in the month of December, we're going to be having Saturday meetings with our men's and women's groups. Um, we're also going to be having a Christmas party for each of those uh, groups, just kind of a fun activity uh, time together. And so there'll be more information coming up about that on our website as well. Uh, one way in the month of December that we really try to focus, I guess, on the Christmas story, if you will, or the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the promise of God coming into this world is through what historically has been called Advent. Um, but what we would like to encourage our church family to do is during the month of December, and this is a great family activity, uh, gather together and read one chapter from the book of Luke every day. And so beginning on December 1st, all the way leading up through Christmas. And so what you're going to find is that uh, from the first chapter of Luke, we have all the way from the birth of Jesus through his whole life and ministry, um, all captured uh, in really one month, which really encompasses uh, the gospel story. And so you can do that as a family, uh, one chapter per day through the book of Luke in the month of December. One other announcement we wanted to let you know about is that on December 24th, uh, we're going to be having a Christmas Eve service here at the church at 6 p.m. Uh, that's a candlelit service, and this is uh, something we've done in the past, just kind of a special time together to worship the Lord and uh, it's a really unique atmosphere, and so I would encourage you that, you know, if you're able to make it, uh, 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. So the last thing I wanted to tell you about is that with everything going on uh, in, around us right now, it is possible that we may have to um, uh, go to more virtual services, which you're watching now, of course, but uh, we want to be able to communicate these things clearly to you, and one way that we can do that is through a text messaging service. If you could sign up for that, it would ensure that we would be able to communicate clearly with you and you with us as well. And so after the announcements today, there's going to be um, a slide up on the screen, and you can pause that video. But basically, you just have to send a text message and confirm it, and you will begin to receive uh, announcements from Abundant Life. Great way to make sure that you don't miss anything coming from the church. That's it for announcements today. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of today's service. We've got a bringing us back coming up next, which is just a connection between two sermons uh, that a member from our church family does, and today's going to be Phyllis Fisher, so we're super pumped about that, uh, and then we'll get into today's word from Exodus chapter 11. Blessings. In Exodus 10, God begins by establishing testimonies to the reality of his omniscience, that he alone is God. An oral history is developed for future generations in song and in story. Thus, we have the Seder leading up to the Passover to teach and remind us of our history. However, Egyptians developed their own gods 
over centuries of cult contented living so that Pharaoh's pride refuses to entertain the idea of letting his slaves go as much modern Christian people refuse to humble themselves with the res with responsible eating, spending money, morality, health, recreational lifestyles. Moses and Aaron give Pharaoh an ultimatum with, a, uh, with destructive hail. Pharaoh's servants are worried, so Pharaoh tries to manipulate God into letting fewer and fewer of his slave possessions leave Egypt, which brings on hordes of hungry locusts from the sky. Pharaoh repeats his position of pride, hardening his heart, as so Moses raises his hand to heaven and total darkness encompasses Egypt, 72 hours. But there was light in Goshen. This darkness is so complete that it is called thick darkness, as it, as it is in hell. Uh, I had an experience of this darkness when I, uh, my husband and I took my grandson back to Alabama. We stopped at Luray Caverns. At the end of the tour, we stopped in a big room uh, uh, under the, in, in the caves, and they turned out all the lights, and my grandson clutched my husband's neck so hard that uh, Jim choked, and uh, it was very scary. A place for the, uh, hell's a place for the unrighteous, fornicators, wicked, covetous, maliciousness, uh, envious mur murderers, quarrelsome people, liars, malignity, backbiting, haters of God, proud, boasters, uh, inventors of e uh, evil things, disobedient to parents, covenant breakers, without mutual affection, implacable, unmerciful. And that comes from Romans 1, 26 through 31. Moses in Let Goshen tells the Hebrews not to be afraid of the Egyptians as he returns from being exiled from Egypt because Pharaoh once more hardens his heart. Moses says to them, be calm and we will experience the salvation of the Lord. In this telling of the historical event, we are called as Christians to repent of involvement in our culture of selfishness and bless and pray for the American people and our governing authorities. Hey, so here we are, today's sermon from Exodus chapter 11. Uh, you can go ahead and open up your Bible to Exodus chapter 11 if you're on a device or something and you can do a separate tab and go to Bible.com. Uh, that's fine too. We'll also have our sermon or our, our notes today on the screen uh, from Exodus chapter, chapter 11. But uh, we have marched through the first 10 chapters of Exodus. And so the past 10 weeks, one chapter per week, it's been a great way to approach this story. We've got all of our sermons available on our website, uh, which you can check out at your convenience. But, you know, in this journey, we've seen God's people uh, kind of find themselves in this bondage that has, for them, lasted for hundreds of years, and a bondage that they were never intended uh, to walk in. It was never intended to be their portion or their path. And, you know, even as we say that out loud, just kind of setting this before us, it makes me wonder if too often we sacrifice the life that the Lord has for us for something entirely different. If we're just all about our journey and our path and really have no, um, you know, no idea that the Lord might have something entirely different for us, all the while calling it normal. And so I think today and throughout this story that the Lord is really trying to shake up uh, your concept of normal. And so in the story of the Exodus, we've seen the Lord raise up Moses, you know, the, the champion and hero of the Israelites. But, you know, from a baby, he was destined for death. 
He was uh, this life that was set to be thrown into the Nile, this, and then he became this child who was raised, you know, in the palace, and he began, he grew in influence in Egypt, of course, as, as he grew uh, in the palace. And then he leaves Egypt, and we find this man wandering in the wilderness, but the Lord puts his finger on Moses, and he uses him to be this mouthpiece for deliverance. You see, Moses' people had been in bondage, slavery, for hundreds of years at the hand of their oppressor, the Egyptians. And the Lord is going to use Moses to bring them to this place of freedom and to this place where they can worship him. We've seen the Egyptians and Pharaoh reject the mercy of the Lord. And instead of receiving that mercy, they've settled for judgment and they've settled for plagues. To this point, we've seen nine plagues um, come to the Egyptians. In Exodus 5, too, we see this very pointed question that comes from Pharaoh and unfortunately is often echoed in our own words and in our own actions. And it's this question, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Now, through the journey of the story of the Exodus, we've seen the plagues that have come, right? We, they, they've brought the Egyptians and the gods of the Egyptians to their knees in submission. And even in the middle of all of that, we've seen Pharaoh's heart grow harder and harder, more stubborn and more resistant, more angry, digging his heels in, that he might have to submit his life to something other than himself. The nerve of that, right? This is Pharaoh's heart. And there have been times where it looked like Pharaoh was about to turn, was about to submit to the Lord, but in the end, he has gone back to the behavior that he has, you know, uh, become known for throughout this narrative. He was a god unto himself. Literally, in this day, Pharaoh was viewed as a god, and so he was a god unto himself. Nobody was going to tell him what to do. Does that sound like anybody today? At the heart of the story of the Exodus, we see many of Pharaoh's struggles, and, and we can relate. We can see that these are often our struggles as well. You know, many of the Israelites' reality in this, the bondage that they face, the oppression that they face, at times that can be our reality as well. And so throughout this story of the Exodus, we see some, you know, some maybe some truths in this story that we can pull forth. One of the things is that we see that Yahweh... The Lord, our God, will have no other competition. We see that the Lord is a rescuer of his people, that the, Lord, that the Lord's people are created to be free, not to be in bondage. We see that the Lord will fight for his people. The Lord will free his people from the bondage that this world brings. And if we were to bring that to a personal level, getting into Exodus 11 today, if, if we were to bring that right down to our level in our life, in our you know, Monday, if you will. Those same statements ring true. The Lord will have no competition in my life. He won't. He won't settle for anything less than full devotion. We see that the Lord is my Redeemer and my Rescuer. The Lord has created me to be free from the bondages that this world offers. The Lord fights for me and the Lord will deliver me. And so we see all of that in this story, and it should resonate deeply within us, especially in light of the fullness of Scripture, that the Lord has made a way for your life. And I hope today that the hope of the gospel can really stir up some new affections for you. And so we're going to get into Exodus chapter 11, and we're just going to take it a few verses at a time. There's only 10 verses in this whole chapter, and so we'll, we should cruise right through this, but I, I hope that this word stirs something within you, that you would echo what, you know, uh, what the Lord was saying to the Israelites, that they could experience freedom to worship Him, freedom apart from the oppression that this world offers. We see some things in Exodus chapter 11, so we'll, we'll start with verse 1 here. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt, Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Now, when we see this, there's a finality in this statement. 
I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt, says the Lord. One more. So we've reached this point of no return. No return for Pharaoh, no return for his nation. After this judgment, the people of God will be set free. It's a very final statement that the Lord is making here. And we see that in the fullness of the the plan of God. We find the judgment that our lives were destined for. We see this in the fullness of Scripture, that that judgment that we see come upon those that oppose the Lord that was really destined for us. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, we see that Jesus Christ on the cross took that punishment upon Himself. And if we would receive Him as our Savior, we would not receive the judgment and the wrath of God, not the penalty of death, but we would literally be raised to life with Christ. Instead of the, the, the wrath of God, we would actually live in this place of grace and mercy with Him forever. And so in this story of the Exodus, we see this precursor, this, this hint of what was to come, this hint or this, this shadow of the fullness that Jesus would bring. But we see that in Exodus 11, verse 1, that this is the final point for the Egyptians. Remember that this has been an escalation of grace and of mercy laid before the Egyptians, each plague coming with it, an opportunity for repentance. But with this final plague, we notice something, that that offer is removed. When I read that, man, there is something just like a cold splash of water in the face. There is no more opportunity for them for repentance. That, that ship has sailed, if you will. This judgment from the Lord will be complete, and it will completely sever Israel's connection with Egypt. See, Egypt will no longer have a hold on them. 400 years was enough time. The Lord said, enough is enough. But remember, he came first with grace and with mercy. See, and in, in, uh, Jesus says it like this in, in John 8, 36, about freedom in the life of, you know, of God's people. Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And Jesus' ministry was really rooted in freedom. He came to bring liberty to those who were in captive. And so we see this parallel to the story of the Exodus. And this is not a story that is just isolated, you know, to this Exodus narrative, but it's one that every human must wrestle with. That's that's you and I. We are confronted with this moment where God extends grace and mercy and the hope of the gospel, that if you could embrace this, you could experience freedom. You would embrace a life of freedom and submission to the Lord. That's why the gospel comes before you. But what does it mean to be free? You know, in Galatians 5.1, we read this in, in verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. See, you were released into freedom. He's saying, don't go back to the Egypts of this world or of this life. So the Israelites in this narrative will soon be free. God is declaring it. And those who oppose and reject the Lord, they will be brought low. See, there is a time coming when repentance will no longer be possible for us either. I don't know when that day will be, but we do know that it's coming. It's this day of judgment. The, the Bible is very clear about, about, that very, about that very thing. And this can be a scary thing to consider. How long can we continue to reject the goodness and the mercy of the Lord? He continues to come and says, son, and says, daughter, come. How many times can we reject that? Going on to verse 2, we read here, Speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask his neighbor, and every woman from her neighbor, articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, The man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. The Lord gave the Israelites favor in the sight of the Egyptians. See, Pharaoh wasn't convinced. He wasn't convinced, even though nine plagues had come. 
But the people of Egypt, they had seen enough. They had, they had seen enough, in fact, that they were willing to give the people who had been held captive parting gifts. You know, they, they were willing to send them on their way with an incentive to leave. Not only did the people of the Lord not leave empty-handed, but they were marching toward their destiny with all that they would need to be a prosperous people. You see, when the, when the Lord sets a life free, it's not with, without all that you need for the journey ahead. And I'm not saying that, you know, when you uh, give your life to the Lord, that gold and silver are just going to be pouring in. But what I am saying is that the Lord will be with you every step of the journey. It might seem like a scary thing to, to surrender your, your whole life to the Lord, giving up all that you've considered to be normal. But what good would it be if, if you could gain the whole world and lose your very soul. You see, by this time in the story, it, it seemed that the people of Egypt were understanding that their gods were no match for Jehovah. Now, many of you are probably familiar with hero stories, and this is very much a hero story. And everybody loves a hero story. You know, my kids, when they, when they dress up, they like to dress up like heroes. Not often do they like to dress up like villains. And there's a reason. It's because from a young age, we are enamored with the story of the hero. And hero stories usually go like this. You know, we start with an unjustly oppressed person or a group, and then the hero comes in and rescues them uh, when they need the hero the most. And then oftentimes, you know, they ride off into the sunset. You know, in reality, when we struggle, oftentimes we desire for something or someone to step in and miraculously help us. You know, we're waiting when our, when our uh, finances are a mess. We want that rich uncle to leave us a huge inheritance that we never knew about. Or, or something. We're always looking for something to come and, and help us. And sometimes when we are in great need, we do get the help that we are looking for. But as, you know, we know and we experience through this life, almost always that that help has some form of limit. Even when we are the hero in the story, and we come and we help somebody else, there's only so much that we can do. You see, the story of the Exodus and the message of the gospel is that we have a, we have a hero in our story, in the story called life. That hero is literally the Lord himself, and he is completely available to you. See, he comes to save the Israelites and us, completely. And he doesn't just come and offer this temporary hope or a hope and a help that will, you know, continue uh, for just for a moment, but literally for a lifetime and beyond. His word says that he will never leave us, never turn his back on us, never forsake us. See, in the New Testament, we see that the plan of God for all people is that all people would come to this, you know, what's called the saving knowledge of the Lord. Literally, a knowledge that can save, can transform your life from one that's destined for death and judgment into this other life called, uh, uh, called hope and promise. It's this relationship that would free us from the Egypts of this life, that would open the shackles of our sin that, that we've been held in, in captivity to. See, the Lord comes to fight for you on your behalf. And, you know, it's it's not really, if you look at this story, not really a negotiation that's going on here between Pharaoh and the Lord. And it's not really a negotiation that's going on between light and darkness in your life. You might make it a negotiation. See, Pharaoh, Pharaoh wanted it to be a negotiation. He wanted there to be some middle ground here. And in a negotiation, we have oftentimes two parties who both start with, you know, opposing demands, right? Right? And they tend to work with one another until there's some middle ground compromise where they both feel relatively satisfied. See, the Lord isn't interested in your life living in the middle ground. Not one foot in righteousness and one foot in sin. He's not interested in that. Not one foot in Egypt and one foot in promise. He didn't want the Israelites to go down that path. See, you're made, you were never made to live someplace between Egypt and the promises of the Lord. And the Lord wasn't interested in just making the slavery and the bondage of the Israelites more tolerable or giving them just a little bit more hope. See, His desire is that they would be freed completely or that they'd be able to walk in righteousness with Him and Him alone and to worship Him alone. 
And this is his desire for your life as well. And that is why Jesus came to this earth from heaven. He came to be a sacrifice for the sins of many, taking upon himself the kind of judgment that came upon Egypt. See, judgment that is uh, present for those who live a life that is in opposition to the Lord is a terrible judgment. So if we look at just these first couple of verses, we can summarize these th first three verses in this fashion. The Lord is willing to do anything necessary to see your life freed from sin, anything necessary, even to the point of sending His own Son to be a sacrifice, to be a ransom for yours. And that's pretty remarkable. And so we see this fight going on, but it's not going to be much of a fight. We come to verses 4 through 8, and so we'll read those. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, literally these are the words from the mouth of the Lord, About midnight I will go into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals, then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was never, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue, against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does not does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. He makes a difference between the two of them. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out all the people who follow you. After that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. Now, in reading this, we can almost be taken aback by, by what we might perceive as an injustice. The harshest of the ten plagues, you know, a plague that would end the life of many Egyptian firstborn children. We've seen this increase in the severity Right, of these plagues as the people of Egypt and specifically Pharaoh rejected the word of the Lord as it came to them. So think about this. The word of the Lord comes, they reject. The word of mercy comes, they reject. The word of just grace comes and they reject it. And a few things that we can note in regard to the severity of this plague, if it's you know, at all troubling that the Lord would bring a judgment so harsh that people would perish. But I would remind you as we get into this that in the New Testament we see the fullness of the plan of God, that it's His desire that none would perish, that that would not be the portion. You see, a life that rejects the Lord, so a few things about this passage, a life that rejects the Lord rejects the mercy of the Lord. It rejects the kindness of the Lord and the urging of the Lord to turn. That life will face judgment with no one to stand in the gap for them. It will face judgment alone. See, that life will face judgment with no protection, no advocate, no substitution, and it will be final. See, remember the beginning of this journey started with the Egyptians killing the male babies of the Israelites. Now, in this, the final plague, we see that judgment comes in the form of death for the kingdom of this world that digs their heels in and rejects the Lord time after time, opportunity after opportunity to, to yield, and we see rejection after rejection. So there were escalated warnings and escalated plagues. You know, if there was a curve on this, the, the plagues became more and more severe. This plague didn't happen in this space separate from mercy and grace, however. Plague happened after mercy was extended nine times. Grace nine times came to Pharaoh. Remember, this is the same Pharaoh who said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And the Lord went to drastic measures to change Pharaoh's response. And at times it appeared that it might have taken, but ultimately Pharaoh wasn't willing to yield. He wasn't willing to allow the people of God and the plan of God to go forward. He was in opposition to the Lord of all the universe. Finally, in this, God is ready to end this standoff. That could have been avoided if Pharaoh had acknowledged the Lord. The last thing that we see in this passage here is that we can see in regard to this plague is that evil is awful, that sin brings forth death. See, the damage that has taken place in humanity cannot be easily undone. 
Not in our own strength. It, 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 we can't. There's nothing we can do to fix what has been broken. See, the rejection of the Lord generation after generation is not a light thing, and it's not easy to shake a life free from. We'd like to think that the Lord could just change a heart, could just change a mind whenever He wants to just kind of flip the switch, right? But there must be a price paid for sin. That price has been, you know, since the book of Genesis, since the book of Genesis, a sacrifice, a death. If you look back to the book of Genesis, we see that the shame which sin brings forth shame in us. We see that the sin and disobedience from the garden was covered through a sacrifice, a death, that the people of Lord of the Lord could have life. And in the Old Testament, we will see the implementation of sacrifices made to atone for people's sin. We actually see the Lord begin to implement this. Remember now, we're only in the second book of, of the Word. <laughs> There's more to come, right? 64 more books to be exact. Now, in the New Testament, we see the fullness uh, of, of this picture of atonement. And next week, we're going to be looking at this even more closely. We see the fullness of the spotless lamb, the blood that covers our life, that came from, uh, you know, from heaven to, to earth to accept the punishment that brings us peace, to be the atonement for this separation, the payment. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about the Passover prophetic picture of uh, the Messiah. And so we see this contrary picture here in this story of the Exodus. You know, we have on one side the people who are for the Lord, and on the other side we have the people who continue to reject Him. We have on one side hope coming, and we have on the other side anguish coming. We have the peaceful sound of deliverance in the middle of the night that won't even impact the animals, and we have the awful sound of weeping that comes as a people foolishly reject and reject the Lord. We have a pathway towards life and this hopeful future contrasted with, you know, judgment upon the Egyptians that is complete and is devastating. One thing that seems clear to me is this, that the Lord knows who are His. The Lord knows the heart, not just the outward, you know, not just the action, but he knows the inward. He knows the intent. Not just the person who gives their tithes every week or that goes to, through the motion of being a good churchgoer, but he knows the hearts of men and women. He knows those that are marked as his own. And there is coming a day when the Lord will make a distinction. It might seem at times like the kingdoms of this world are thriving. Remember, this world is temporary, it's a whisper. It's, it's for a moment, but there is a day when every knee will bow low before the Lord, just like the Egyptians experienced here. Every tongue will confess that He is God. See, the Egyptians were about to have the worst night of their nation's existence, while the Israelites are about to experience unexplainable peace in that same time. To this point, you know, there. There have been, there's been a way out for Pharaoh, an extended hand of mercy, of grace, but now those have evaporated. Now the Israelites will be leaving. Now the Lord will himself bring judgment upon the land. Now Pharaoh will bend his knee. And we come to verse 9. But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he did not let the children of Israel go out of his land. See, the Lord is saying, I'm coming. I'm coming to rescue my people. You might feel helpless today. You might feel like your life is hidden from the Lord. You might feel like you've been forgotten. You might feel like you are just hopeless. I mean, this season has seen an increase in hopelessness, in chaos, in the lives of many. You might feel like you've been walking in the same bondage for years, for generations maybe, the same things your parents struggled with. Maybe you are still wrestling with those. Maybe it goes back further. 
Maybe you've just been struggling to get away from oppressive thoughts and habits of this life. I want to tell you that the message of this word is that freedom is yours. It is, it is not a fleeting thought. It is not a pie-in-the-sky type you know, thing, but it is a reality that in the Lord Jesus Christ, He has called His people to be free, to walk in a freedom where they can worship Him apart from the things that have kept them in bondage for a lifetime. Freedom begins like this. You take a step away from Egypt, right, or in your circumstance, whatever, you know, the, the life that is apart from the Lord you take a step away from those things, and you keep your eyes on the Lord. And guess what you do next? You keep walking. It might seem like, hey, this is going to be a long journey. It would be easier to just go back, but you keep walking. And you walk with purpose, and you walk with conviction, and you leave behind the things of old, and you embrace the journey that's before you. See, Pharaoh's response to the Lord is a tragic warning for our lives, I think to those who are unwilling to yield uh, you know, their lives before the Lord, to bend their knee, to bow down before Him in worship. Pharaoh's life was pulled back and forth, almost ready to submit to the Lord, and then right back to living for himself, right back to hardening his heart, living a life that only bows down to his own will. That's the kind of yo-yo life that can plague you if you allow it to. Living one day for the Lord and the next day for yourself, one day for, for King Jesus and one day for the world. You understand? what We call that lukewarmness, and it's a terrible way to, to live. It's this middle ground that doesn't allow anything to grow, but it might look good on the outside. We want to avoid that at all costs. See, Pharaoh saw the signs. He heard the word of the Lord. He wavered back and forth, but he refused to yield. He refused to be moldable. He refused to let the word of the Lord shape him. He wanted control. He wanted to dominate. He didn't want to submit. The tragic circumstance for Pharaoh is that this could have been avoided. Not only avoided, but you know, by listening to the voice of the Lord, his future would have been one that would have fallen under the category of blessing and not curse. Your life has a similar trajectory today. You can live for the Lord, or you can live in opposition to the Lord. Today, we can live this life in pursuit of hope, the future that's before us, or we can cling tightly to pride, you know, have our hearts grow harder and harder. Our desire to control our destiny and dictate, you know, plans uh, to, to God can, can lead to devastating consequences. And so I just ask you a few things as we close today. Are you the Lord's today? Are you one of His people? Or maybe you're just somebody who knows about God. You've heard about God, but you don't, you don't know Him. See, there's a freedom that is yours, that is extended in mercy and in love and in grace. It's extended through the cross of Jesus as He came to take upon Himself you know, the punishment for your, your Pharaoh-like heart that is just hard and calloused for the sin that plagues this life. But here's, here's the thing. You must receive Him as your Lord and as your Savior. Lord, meaning that He can inform you how to walk. Your Savior, meaning he, that you receive this payment for you, the sin that's in your life. See, the life of a Christ follower, it's not an easy one. I've been serving Jesus for 20 years now, and it hasn't been an easy journey. But there's been no greater reward on this earth than living for the Lord. You know, as your life leans more and more and more into His, one thing that I know you will experience is peace. You're going to find peace like the Israelites experienced, that in the middle of the, you know, the darkest night, they had peace. You're going to find hope in the crowd of chaos. As the noise is raging around you, there's going to be a peace in you because you know who holds your future. See, this is the life of one who follows Jesus. And so as I close today, I'm just going to pray for you here in a minute. 
And uh, I just want to encourage you, turn your eyes and your affections to the Lord. Lay low those things, anything that rises up within you that would keep you from the future that the Lord has for you. If you need, you know, it's great in seasons like this to have friends, to have people you can communicate with. If you're wrestling with things, find a trusted friend that can, you know, uh, you know help you keep your eyes on the Lord. You've got a great future, a great hope before you today, but you must leave Egypt. You must leave the things that are, are really kind of keeping you shackled from the places that the Lord wants to take your life. He wants to see you free to worship Him. He wants to see you free from oppression, free from bondage. And so let's pray together today that, that the Holy Spirit would reveal in our hearts those areas where you know, maybe we are not fully devoted to the Lord. Maybe we've never in our whole lives really fully submitted ourselves to. Maybe we've been living, uh, you know, in that lukewarm area, one foot in the kingdom, one foot on this earth. That's no way to live. Let's pray together. You know, you can lay those things before the Lord, and He is able to help you navigate those things. He's wonderful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all truth. Father, we thank you that you haven't left us in Egypt, that you haven't left us as orphans, but you've, you've come to rescue and you've come to save and you've come to set free your creation, free to worship you, Lord. And so I ask Holy Spirit right now for anyone whose ears are listening to this message, Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would um, convict, that it would bring uh, to our attention areas, if not our entire life, but the, the areas where we are, you know, really uh, rejecting you, Lord, or maybe where we're just living in the middle. Father, help us to live um, passionate, you know, lives that are in hot pursuit of, of you and that are really um, destined to, to walk into freedom. Father, help us to, to leave the Egypts of this life. Father, help to bring us into freedom. We don't want to live in bondage anymore. We give our lives to you right now in Jesus' name.